Facebook. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us on a, a nice sunny afternoon here in Houston. Uh, I'm John with Murder by the Book, and we're so excited today to have Reese Bowen here to talk with us about her newest Lady Georgie mystery, The Last Mrs. Summers. Uh, she's a New York Times bestselling author, has been nominated for every major award in mystery writing, including the Edgar, and has won many, including both the Agatha and the Anthony Awards. She's also the author of the Molly Murphy Mysteries, set in turn of the century New York, and the Constable Evans Mysteries, set in Wales, as well as two internationally bestselling standalone novels. She was born in England and now divides her time between Northern California and Arizona. How are you today, Reese? Um, I'm hanging in there well. You know, my husband, when they ask him and they say, how are you? He says, well, I'm still alive. And I think that's how people <laughs> feel at the moment, actually. <laughs> no, I'm doing well, thank you. Uh, we, we're in a nice part of the world. The temperature is very good. I mean, I have to say, having been in Houston in the summer, we have, we have mm. 70, so it's quite pleasant. And um, we live in a nice area. We take walks among, you know, in the countryside, so I'm not complaining. Yeah. Awesome. And if you guys have been watching our uh, live events, you will realize we have a new face with us. We have Cindy Burnett, who is a uh, bookseller at Murder by the Book. She is um, also a huge fan of Reese's series. Um, and she also runs Conversations from a Page, which we'll give her some time to talk about a little bit later so you can see what she's doing. Um, so she is going to chat with Reese for a little bit. Real quick, I wanted to mention, um, we do have some signed book plates to go with the new book. So when you place your order, you'll get a signed book plate. And also, if you're watching on Facebook, if you have any questions for Reese, you can drop those in the comments and um, we will relay those to her in a little bit. So I am going to pop away and let you guys chat and I will see you in a little bit. Great. Awesome. Thanks, yeah. John. Hi. Well, hello, Reese. How are you? How are you, Cindy? Good. I'm so excited to get to do this interview because I absolutely love your books. And um, so exciting it must be to have a 14th book in the series at this point. That's just amazing. Can you, yeah, can you believe it? You know, when I did that first book and I had this young woman whose voice came to me so instantly, I mean, I thought I'd like to write something so different, you know, something the most unlikely sleuth in the world. And I thought, oh, what if she was royal, but she was penniless? And I just started writing and, you know, she just started saying her, her name and then she started and her voice was just there. And it has been ever since she's been sort of really in my head almost, you know, it's, um, it, it's she's so easy to write because she just takes over and talks and I just follow along. Well, that's so fun. And I've been with reading the series since the very first one and, you know, so excited every year when a new one comes out. So I'm sure that's just got to be such a nice feeling. You've got such an amazing fan base. I just see every time you have a new book come out, they're all over Instagram. And um, that's got to be just a very nice feeling. Well, you know, it never gets old. You, you might say I've done, I think I've done 45 mysteries now or mysteries and historical novels. And every time you see your book on a shelf somewhere or anytime someone, someone, I, I've been getting so many emails with this saying, um, you're helping me get through this worst of this pandemic. And it's only because of your books or, you know, I was sick or my mom was sick and, and your books have kept me going. It's an incredibly strange feeling for a writer that, you know, you're not just entertaining, you're actually helping in a way. It feels really nice. Oh, I'm sure it does. Then that's wonderful. Um, and, and, you know, it's such a crazy time. And so to have something like that to grab onto and people that maybe hadn't stumbled upon the series yet to be able to start from the beginning and just read them all at one time, I'm a little jealous of that. <laughs> <laughs> so do you want to tell me a little bit about The Last Mrs. Summers? Yeah, I do. Um, Georgie, the last book where we left Georgie, she'd had a honeymoon in Kenya. So she'd been out of the country in exotic situation, etc. So I really felt it was time to bring her back to her roots and to England. And we hadn't seen much of Belinda, you know, Georgie had got married and then we'd been to Kenya. And I love that relationship between, you know, the best friends, Georgie and Belinda, so different. Jo Belinda so worldly and so sure of herself and Georgie so naive and so in awe of Belinda. And then of course we've turned everything around when Belinda got pregnant and, um, and now Belinda's more vulnerable and Georgie's in a better place. So we've sort of twisted that relationship, which was fun. And I thought, I go to Cornwall every summer. I spend every summer with my sister-in-law in Cornwall, who has a house, one of those big, beautiful manor houses dating from the 14th century with a haunted room. Um, and so that's the first place we go to. Whenever we land in England, we get on the train, we go straight down to Cornwall. Her driveway is half a mile. You drive up her drive, you get into her house and you go, 
and it's just <laughs> like all the cares of the world just slip away so you know I'm, I can't spend my summer in Cornwall this year so I'm so glad my book's out because actually I can vicariously go to Cornwall so I knew I wanted to set a book there the other driving force of course behind this book was Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca and uh, that had been one of the first books that I read as a teenager that sort of showed me what a book could do. Until then, I'd read a book for entertainment. You know, I'd read Agatha Christie, and Agatha Christie, a good puzzle, fun little village. But this was a book that actually played with my emotions. And this was so, so new to me, the fact that you could take the reader and you could make her believe something and then halfway through the book you could say haha I fooled you and you know and you were really upset and the whole brooding atmosphere I thought this is this is fantastic you know so I thought it'd be fun to go back and visit Rebecca and I thought well what you know what if Georgie and Belinda get themselves in a big house like this with an unexplained death and a creepy housekeeper and all the sort of all the things that we loved about Rebecca. Um, and then what would happen to them there? So I took it from there. So it, it was a really fun book to write. Um, did you base Rose's house on your sister-in-law's house? Uh, no, I based the other one, the, the house that Belinda had had a grandmother who had died and had had a lovely house in Cornwall. And I've called it Trangilly. And it's funny because all the names mean something in the book. And next, next to my sister-in-law's house is called Mirth and Manor. But their local pub, which is like five miles away down a really scary windy lane, is called the Trengilly Water. So I thought that's the that's the homage to the Trengilly where I've had many a good pint. Um, so that's so that was the house that I based my sister-in-law's on. The big scary house is based on other houses I'd been at in Cornwall that, you know, had the long dark corridors and <coughs> some of it, of course, is I grew up in um, a big spooky house not nearly as glamorous or any grand or anything but it did have long dark corridors and the wind used to come in and flap the mats in the doorways and things so you know that a, a part of that is also in this house that it was a not a not a comfortable place to be in um well and you've been posting a lot on instagram cornwall the cream tea and the narrow lanes and i was really enjoying browsing through that and i bet your readers have been too to sort of visualize what they're reading about well i've enjoyed it too because as i say no, this is the first summer in many many years when we haven't been in cornwall at this time of year so there i am looking at the pictures of you know uh Cadgeworth and Coverack and all the little villages that I know, those little fishing villages. And I'm going, ah. of course, when I look at those lanes, I don't go, ah. I go, ah. because uh, driving down them is, a, I, if you haven't seen these lanes, you cannot imagine, they're probably, they're just wide enough in some places for two vehicles to pass. And they have these high hedges on either side. And sometimes they're not even hedges, they're stone walls. So there's nowhere to go. And um, once I took a group of hiking friends to Cornwall. And so there were six of us, so we had a van. I was driving the van and we're coming through a part of one of the, these lanes and they're coming towards us is a double decker bus. <laughs> so I pulled into the side of the lane as much as I could. So the flowers all came in through the windows into our faces and the bus, I swear, it passed my mirror by that much. And there have been many occasions apparently where these buses actually take off mirrors because the locals know the lanes so well, they go at a hell of a bait. They, you know, literally the, the buses come through these lanes like this. And um, so the driving is scary. And um, John, when John drives there, he's very cautious. And so he will come around a corner like this. And when we drive with our nephews or anything, they say, put your foot down, Uncle John, don't just. You know. <laughs> so that's the scary part about Cornwall. Of course, the other thing you've just mentioned, which is the very, very best part about Cornwall is the food. When we get there, the first thing we do the first day, we go into Falmouth and we go to the Oggy Oggy pasty shop and we buy a Cornish pasty. And we go and sit on the quayside with all the seagulls and the boats and that lovely smell of sea. And then we eat our pasty. And for those of you who don't know what a pasty is, it's a pastry and inside you've got warm uh, your onions, potatoes, turnips and meat. And it's sort of 
steam through beautifully inside and you take one bite and you get all those flavors. The interesting thing about pasties, if you look at them, they've got this rim of pastry around the outside. They were first made for the tin miners who would go down the mines and their wives would make these for them so they could hold the outside rim with their dirty hands, eat the interior and then throw away because they didn't have a chance to wash their hands first. So they were, they were a useful thing, but now, now they're just delicious. And you can also get them like, you know, you can get chicken and leek or, you know, lamb and chutney. You get all sorts of different lovely flavors now, but I like the traditional ones. So we have to have one of those. And then the other thing we have to have is a cream tea. Cornish clotted cream is next to heaven. It's, <laughs> it's it, first of all, the cows down there are the Guernsey cows that make this very rich milk. And then their cream is skimmed off and slightly heated so that it turns into, it looks like thick yellow butter, but it doesn't taste like butter. It tastes just like wonderful cream. And then you spread that on top of a warm scone. And then you take a big dopple of, of strawberry jam and you put that on top and then you eat it off. Oh. Ah. I'm hungry. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to have to go eat as soon as we're done. <laughs> I look at all my photos of, of cream teas and I put them on Instagram and I go, oh, oh. And of course, then there's fish and chips and there's all sorts of really good food is a major part of being in Cornwall for me. So I made sure it was part of the book because they have this housekeeper. Uh, she might be spooky, but she produce, makes the kitchen produce these wonderful meals all the time. So that's another thing. I love to live vicariously in books, don't you? When you read a book, don't you love to read? live vicariously through the food in that book you know if it's a book set in France you go oh the baguette oh the fromage <laughs> so yeah, yeah. yeah. But not even just the food I love a great sense of place period which I think is kind of what you're describing with this home and in the, the narrow halls and the spooky housekeeper I love being transported completely to a different place or or Cornwall and your descriptions of Cornwall and, you know especially right now when we can't go hardly anywhere it's it's nice to travel via a book Oh, I, that's, you know, that's one of the reasons that I started writing mysteries was that I read Tony Hillerman and he was the first writer who really took me to another place. And I just felt I was there. So when the first time I went to the Southwest, I was a complete tour guide for my husband. We're driving along and I go, oh, you see over there? that ship rock, and you see that ledge on ship rock, that's where the body fell down from. And that field there, I, I knew everything Thing because he'd taken me there and I thought that's what I want to write I want to take someone somewhere because I love whenever I read a book I love to have a mini vacation that takes me either to another place or another time and so that you know if I'm reading I was reading one of Louise Penny's book Louise is one of my dearest friends and I love her books and I was reading the one that takes place in the middle of an ice festival and I sort of got up and got a a shawl to put around me <laughs> and then I realized it's the middle of summer you know and I'm so cold because I'm reading this book and that's what a good book can do to you it can take you somewhere so that's what I love to do when I write is I hope when you read the books that you are in Cornwall and you get the feel of what it's like coming around that windy headland and there's the standing stones which are so spooky you know so, yeah, it's, no, I love it. I think you do a great job of that. And the other picture that I loved that you posted was of St. Ives, like a fishing village, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was beautiful. Oh, St. Ives is one of my favorite places. Unfortunately, these days, it's become so popular with tourists that, you know, you can't find anywhere to park. And there's a little train that goes um, from St. Earth to St. Ives. And um, we last time we were there last summer, we said, oh, let's just get on the train. Let's not try and find anywhere to park. We went to the train and there is a line probably half a mile long waiting to get on the train. Wow. So we gave up and we went to a less popular fishing village, but St. Ives is absolutely so beautiful. And um, I'd like to have a little house there actually. And, uh, That's what I was summer. thinking. <laughs> yeah. It's funny because right now um, I have this great, I suppose we all have this desire to be somewhere safe. And so I find I'm thinking of home a lot even though I've lived in America for 50 years so you'd think this is this is home but I've been watching every afternoon on television there's a program called escape to the country in which people in England leave the town and go and buy English country cottages it's one of these real estate things and I watch it and I sit there going 
oh, look, they're in Somerset. Oh, look, they're in Cornwall. Oh, and, you know, every day it's like this, please let me buy this. You know, it, this is so cheap. Okay, I'll buy it. Cool. <laughs> um, my husband is the sensible one. And we were in Wales once and we saw this little cottage for sale and it was 29,000. And I said, oh, I should buy this. And the sensible husband said, and the other 11 months of the year when you're not here and there's a storm and the roof blows off and um, the roof leaks and you find, you know, so all the sensible things about what happens when you're not in a cottage for 11 months of the year and it's so much easier to rent one. But I think the thought of just owning something there would be very appealing. No, I've always thought that too. We go to Colorado a lot in the summer and we've debated that forever. But I do think you, when you're not there, but you know, a couple of weeks or a month, then it's just a lot of work. And then also that way you can rent different properties each time and see different places. But I agree that idea of actually owning something is very tempting. Yeah. I mean, we do have, we, I mean, we, we already have a house in Arizona where we spend our winters. Um, and we leave that normally from April through to the beginning of November. But I do have, I have a go gardener who comes in and we have the pest man who comes in so people are keeping an eye on it and my daughter lives there and she will come by every now and then so I know it's being looked after there but you know if it were in Wales the, <laughs> roof, could fall, the roof could fall in and nobody would tell me yeah six months later you're like uh-oh <laughs> or, or the rats could move in and you come back and there's a very large infestation that would not be fun either uh, well, what other kind of research did you do for this? Obviously, some of the part based on Rebecca and Cornwall, but tell me about your research process for this one. Um, well, I, the first research started when I was in Cornwall last year. And so just driving, I knew where I wanted to set it. So just driving that route. And of course, one of the difficulties is this is 1930. The tourist industry was really very small in those days. Um, and so when I drive that route now out towards around that headland past rock and rock has now become a very fashionable place to live. And there's like, there's like uh, uh, mobile home sites and little cottages and things all the way. Whereas when she came, there would be, it would be bleak, you know, there would be a small village and then you drive for a long way, a couple more houses. Couple, couple, you know, that. So I had to picture and, um, uh, so that's one thing you have to do is to take yourself back in time. Uh, but I did drive the actual route and see when, you know, when do you leave the houses behind? When does it go up to the headland? What do you see in the other direction? All those sort of things. Um, and um, of course, I love part of the research always for my books is going to the local pub, sitting there with a pint of cider and just listening to people, listening to them talk. And in Cornwall, they still have their own lovely accent. You go into a shop in Cornwall and the person behind the counter will go, and what can I get for you, my lovey? Um, <laughs> and um, they're, they're so sweet. I was once catching a ferry and I looked at the time and I saw it was about to leave and I was hurrying down the dock and there's an old man sitting there on the dock and he says, you don't need to run, my lovey. He's still having his dinner. And that's what life is. It's really slow down there. And so just feeling the feel of Cornwall is great. But I read Rebecca again, and I was very pleased. I was in, um, I was in a used bookstore in Truro, which is the capital of Cornwall. And I found a copy of, uh, of Rebecca, probably, I don't know if it's a first edition, but it was a really old one. So that, was, that gave me a nice feel of reading something that you know has 1930s on it. So I was reading that. And in, interestingly, different emotions when I'm reading it this time, because this time I was so annoyed with the second Mrs. De Winter, who doesn't even have a name. She is so faceless compared with the first Mrs. De Winter that she doesn't even name herself. And I wanted to slap this woman. Have you read the book? You know, she, she marries this older, very rich man and she comes to his house and the house is like um, a shrine to his first wife. Everything the first wife did was perfect. She rode horses perfectly. She knew how to dress. She decorated the house and everything is a, a homage to her. And um, the new wife, I know she's a young woman and she's come from a humble background, but she doesn't dare to change anything. And I found myself thinking, okay, if they said the vase had always stood there in the window, 
I'd say, well, that's too bad because now I want it on that table over there, but she never does do that. So uh, it was interestingly different emotions this time when I, when, when I, I read it. So I think that, that, that tinged a bit how I approached the book. That, you know, I didn't like the first Mrs. Summers for a long time because, um, I mean, my story, you will see some similarities. It's not the same story. Um, I've done the, I've done, if you've read Rebecca, you will smile at quite a lot of things in the book because I've used the same things. But again, I'm twisting things for you because I'm making you believe things that didn't really happen. So, you know, that that's fun to do always. That sort of story because you, you have a framework. I mean, every time you write a mystery, you have a framework anyway. Someone finds a body, someone has to solve the crime, it is solved. Um, but with this, I had the framework of what happened in Rebecca versus what would happen in my book. Um, so, you know, I did have a lot more to go on than I do in a lot of my mysteries. And I had to make it work out in the end. I had to make it dangerous and I had to make it worrying and I had to make it solve it, solve it nicely at the end. Um, and I had to make sure that, that, that we bring Darcy in too, because, you know, George's husband is incredibly popular. And if yes. I'd done a book without, if I'd done a book without Darcy, you know, I've already got all these emails going, where was Darcy in this book? <laughs> I've already got emails saying, you didn't take Queenie with you. Queenie is the maid, right. for those of you who don't know. Queenie is the worst maid in the universe, um, but she's, Georgie is stuck with her. And lots of people love to hate Queenie because she ruins everything that she touches. And she is not the least bit deferential. And she's never learned to call Georgie my lady. And um, so she, she's not a disaster but people like to have her around so I wanted to take her to Cornwall but but Belinda has bought this little open top sports car and I pictured trying to cram <laughs> Queenie into the back seat of this I mean Queenie's a large girl to start with um, and they need their luggage and I thought there's nowhere to put her now could I send her down on a train afterwards but then she'd be in the she'd be you know so it became impossible, but I promise everybody the book I'm starting to write now, which will be a Christmas book, and which is going to be called God Rest Ye Royal Gentlemen. Oh, fun. <laughs> Queen, Queen, Queenie does, um, does play quite a big part in it, so she will be there. Well, I love Belinda. So I was happy to see that Belinda was making a big part of the story again. Um, and I love Queenie too. And so that's good to know she's up next. Now, is that your next one that will come out? The, the one? Um, well, I'm just starting to write it now. So it will come out, not this Christmas, right. but next Christmas. So. Okay. But it's the next in the series? The next in the series. Yes. Yeah. And they asked me to write another Christmas book because the 12 clues of Christmas had been so very successful. And also Christmas books are such fun, you know, you can have the roaring fires and the Christmas pudding and the crackers and everything. And the interesting thing about writing this book is I have a big challenge because my books are funny. And we're in Christmas 1935. And we know that in the beginning of the new year, King George is going to die. Right. Um, and the Prince of Wales is going to become Edward VIII. And then we've got the whole Mrs. Simpson sing and he's going to abdicate. So we have really big and shattering things coming up. So I wanted to make us involved in those. So I take, I'm taking Georgie to a house at the edge of the Sandringham estate, which is where the king and queen are spending Christmas. And I'm, I've got a mystery that would link to the royal family. So um, then at the end of the book, I think we're going to have to find that King George has died. Um, and then we, you know, we look ahead to a completely new chapter. Obviously, people have asked me with this series, are you going to take it up to World War II? And I would like to because of, it would mean that Darcy can do his spying and maybe Georgie can find something at Bletchley Park or some sort of spying. You know, she's become rather good at this. But then you've got this hugely, writers always walk a fine line between um, you know, between offending the reader and exciting the reader. And if you've got World War II, which was not funny, you know, how do you, how do you have that line of going to rescue someone in Germany when we know such terrible things were going on? All that sort of thing becomes rather difficult. You can, of course, deal with trying to find a spy hidden in England. That would be a fun thing to do. And I did that, obviously, in one of my standalones in Farley Field was all about a spy within England, and that, that was a fun book to write too. I like, you know, all of my books I can say so far 
of being a book I'd really like to read and wasn't on the shelf. So someone had to write it because I wanted to read it. So I wrote it. Um, that's how I approach a book. And I love to, I want to get back to my book. If I can say to myself every morning, oh, I can't wait to get to that. Then I know I'm doing the right thing. That's a sign of a good book. And I loved In Farley Field. I still recommend that to people. It's such a great book. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so do you, are you, uh, do you plot out your entire book? Do you outline each one or do you just sort of sit down and listen to what Georgie tells you? I mean, obviously it sounds like you thought through a little bit with King George dying in the Christmas 1935, but how do you normally work? Well, it depends on the book. This one, of course, I had the knowing what happened in Rebecca right. and needing something that similar was going to happen. So I knew I wanted Belinda to inherit a property to go down to get this property and find it wasn't at all what she thought it was going to be and to be at a bit of a loss what to do and then to find themselves suddenly in a place like Manderley. Um, so I knew I, that that much. I wasn't quite sure who was going to be killed and I wasn't quite sure who did it and I wasn't quite sure who did it for quite a lot of the book. Um, uh, I wanted, So I like to be surprised um, but I never outline um, I, I sometimes plot ahead and know exactly what I'd like to happen. Some of the books have been much more fluid than others where I've just taken Georgie somewhere, like for example, the one in Stracer called um, On Her Majesty's Frightfully Secret Service. I wanted Georgie to go to a villa in Italy and somehow be involved with Belinda there and what was happening to Belinda there. So what I do to start with is I look at, at real events. What real event was happening exactly that time? And of course, in Italy, I looked and I found in Stresa, there was an international conference going on between England and France and Italy. And they were discussing how to combat the Nazi threat. And I thought that is very strange because Hitler is, I mean, Mussolini is a huge fan of Hitler. And I thought that I bet that conference was just for show and behind the scenes, something very different was happening. So I thought, oh, I'm gonna send Georgie to a place where the something very different is happening. So that was the driving force in that book. So, and I didn't really know who'd be killed or anything, but you, I just took her there and saw what was going to happen. Some of the books have been plotted very carefully. For example, 12 Clues of Christmas, obviously, someone is killed every day in a manner of the song. So that had to be plotted out <laughs> to get that right. Um, and also um, the one where, lo the last one called um, Love and Death Among the Cheetahs that takes place in Africa. I knew I wanted to send her to the Happy Valley where there were all these British people behaving very badly. And I wanted a, um, I wanted a murder that mirrored the real life murder of Lord Errol at that time. And a murder was never solved. So, you know, I thought someone has to solve it. So I will. Um, so that's about the amount I have, but I never do a chapter by chapter plotting because so much, you know, once I've got Georgie and she's telling me things and the same in the Molly series when Molly's telling me things, um, they sort of go off and I sort of try and keep up with them. And sometimes they make stupid mistakes and um, sometimes they find out things I'd never have found out. And I like to be surprised. I can't tell you how many times in a book a character said something and I go, oh, oh, I didn't realize that. <laughs> and they look at me like, you're rather thick, aren't you? But, um, <laughs> but I, as I say, if the writing has to be fun for me. If it became formulaic for me, I'd stop. I like to be surprised. I like to not know what's going to happen next. I like to be worried for, I mean, I know obviously there's going to be a new book in the series. So Georgie's not going to die, I hope, but I like to be times when I'm worried for her. So that's how I like to write. Oh, well, do you have a favorite of, of your books? Oh God, that's like asking some, a mother, do you have a favorite of your children? Uh, <laughs> I am very, um, I'm very proud of the Tuscan child. Um, which was the second of my big standalones and takes place in, in uh, Tuscany in two different time periods in the present and, and, or not the present, in 1973 and in World War II. And that was a challenge because I was writing two different stories and then blending them together. And I think that worked really well. And, uh, you know, the good thing about that book is it's sold in, I don't know what, 29 languages now. And, um, and it's sold uh, just through Amazon on it sold um three quarters of a million copies so wow congratulations so, that's amazing oh so, you know that, that, that's a nice that's a nice warm thing all around i'm enjoying that 
<laughs> I bet you are. I remember hearing you speak at the bookstore about that and writing the dual timelines. And I think that was the first time you had done that and yeah. um, how yeah. interesting it was to do that. I thought that was very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I have, um, I have, sorry, I was gonna say, I have a new standalone coming out next spring, which I really, which was even more ambitious because it's in three time periods. So uh, it takes place in Venice. So talk about another place that was lovely to escape to this spring We're sitting, with pictures of Venice all around me uh, and writing about Venice. And, you know, it's one of my favorite places in the world. And so it was one of those books I love to read again about someone leaves an enigmatic clue to what happened in the past and someone in the present has to solve it. So, you know, that's, that's, that's a, it's called the Venice sketchbook. Okay, good. Well, I look forward to that. I'll have to keep my eye out for it. Um, so I understand the favorite book. It's hard to pick one. Do you have a favorite character? Is there a character you like to write the best or you've resonated you know, with the best or anything like that? People have asked me if Georgie is, is me. Um, and uh, I don't think she's me. It's just I've made, she's become more and more me. I find she's saying things and I think, oh, well, you know, that's actually what I said or what I would have done. And I think I've, I've given her more and more of my traits. For example, if she's insecure in a place, she tends to be a bit clumsy. You know, she'll back into something or not something over. And I think in my life, that's probably been, been me. And also I think she's, uh, she has a mother who is from a humble background and a father who was Queen Victoria's grandson. So she's poised between two worlds. And I think the fact that I grew up in England and now live in America means that I'm all, always slightly the outsider, slightly the, the observer wherever I go. So I think that's really helped. A favorite character I'd have to say is granddad, Georgie's grandfather. Mm -hmm. He's such a lovely man and he's so warm and he's, he's just what she needs. He's the one person in her life ever who's loved her unconditionally. You know, she's grown up in this big drafty castle with no one really to hug her. And there he does, he hugs her and he loves her and he's there and knowing that she can run to him is a great, a great uh, boon in her life. So I do love granddad, he's lovely. He is lovely. And I'm always happy for her that she does have him and Belinda, but but yes, family wise, um, she kind of got the short end of the stick. So it's nice that she has and him. I love to hate Fig and Mrs. Simpson. I love to make them say the cattiest, most nasty things I can possibly think of. So that that that's another bonus is is making someone really nasty and, and enjoying it too. Well, Fig is definitely that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, do you have a say in your titles? Do you come up with them? How do your book titles come about each time? Um, I've pretty much chosen all my book titles. We've had to tweak some of them. Uh, the, um, uh, which one was it? Oh yeah, Naughty, Naughty in Nice. I wanted to call it Naughty and Nice because you know, Naughty and Nice. And my editor said, no, we can't do that because people would come into the store and they would ask for Naughty and Nice and realize they got it wrong and people don't like to be embarrassed. Yeah. So we changed that. Um, but most of the, the others, I think, I wanted, I called it love among the cheaters. And they said, oh, let's no, let's call it love and death among the cheaters. Um, uh, but mostly I, I, I choose my own titles, which is very nice. And, and I get to choose my own, my own covers completely. They say, what would you like on the cover of this one? And I say, oh, can we have a long drafty hallway with a spooky figure at the end of it? And, and uh, my, my, um, the artist who does the cover art actually lives in San Francisco and he's been to some of my signings and oh. he's, and he sent me the original sketch for the first, before he did the first Georgie, he sketched Georgie. So I have that framed. So that's very nice. But no, I'm very lucky because I mean, how many writers really do get to say, I'd like this on my cover and no, that's not right. And no, the staircase should be bigger. And uh, so I get that. No, that was going to be my next question because the covers are fabulous and totally, I mean, I just think they've captured Georgie. So I was curious if how much of a say you'd had in that. Well, absolutely, yeah, complete say. The, before we start, they say, have you thought ahead to the cover? And I say, yes, I think I'd like so-and-so. And then he does a cover, a, a, you know, a, a Roos cover sketch. And I say, no, the pillar wouldn't look like that in the room. And then he changes that. And, um, uh, uh, and, and then, then my agent, who's also very proactive on everything, she will say, um, no, Georgie's, Georgie needs a red coat. It needs to pop. And then, you know, so um, between us, we come up with really nice covers. 
Definitely. And you know, it's your book the second you see it. And I think that's such good marketing these days. You know, even yeah. if you, you're going by a whole realm of books and you, as soon as I see one, I'm like, yeah. oh, that, that's what that is. Yeah. And that's yeah. really nice because people recognize it immediately. Yeah. Your brand, they call it these days. Right. That's exactly. <laughs> yes. Very well branded. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what do you like to do when you're not reading and writing? Well, that's a sad question. Normally I like to travel. Um, we travel a lot. We go to Europe for about six weeks every summer. We stay with the relatives in Cornwall. And then we usually go over to, like last summer, I flew into Venice and I spent time in Venice doing my research there. And then we got on a train and went to Basel in, in Switzerland, picked up a river cruise, went up to Amsterdam, stayed a few days in Amsterdam, got uh, a train down to Paris, and then we'd rented a house on the Seine about half an hour outside Paris, went down to this house. My oldest daughter and her family flew in to join us. So we had two weeks with them in this lovely part of, you know, right next to Fontainebleau. So the River Seine and all these old lovely villages and, and they could get into Paris easily too. So it was just delightful sitting out on that deck with the Seine flowing below us and having a lovely dinner, finishing off with like, today's baguette and three different cheeses and the I mean that was oh I want to be there now <laughs> no like you're making me <laughs> you're making me want to go to France uh, which unfortunately we can't do at the moment <laughs> I, I, like, I like to paint I like to do watercolors um I have a Celtic harp, harp I like to play um of course I like to read um what else do I like to do what I do like you like to read that was gonna be another one of my questions what do you like to read well, I like to read actually what I like to write. My, if you ask me my favorite writers, they happen to be my closest friends. Um, uh, Louise Penny, Jacqueline Winspear, Charles Todd, um, Deborah Crombie. These are all people who are very dear friends. In fact, Jackie Winspear was sitting on my deck yesterday. So, you know, oh, Cara Black, you know, these are all friends of mine who I, I actually love. But I love the sort of mysteries that are um, that touch your heart, that take you somewhere, that also that give you uh, a feel, that teach you something you didn't know about, you know, what was it like in this industry? What was it like in this place? You learn something too. So I, I like to read those. I like pure historical novels that are not just, you know, I, bl I blurb, I've become the go-to blurb person for anything written in the first half of the 20th century. So if you pick up any book it, and it, it will have a blurb from me on the back, but things like The Poppy Wife, I thought was wonderful. And, um, you know, so, um, so I get to read a lot of books I wouldn't have read otherwise because people send them for blurbs. At the moment, I'm, Jackie yesterday gave me her memoir she's written um, and it's called Next Year We'll Be Laughing. And I started to read it last night. It, really good her prose is just exquisite so I'm enjoying that right now and um, uh, I love travel books too I love to read about because I love to travel but I don't like to I don't like travel to be too difficult right now so I love reading books in which someone is wading through the swamp and the leeches are all over them and it's not me you know that, that's a, but but I love I love to find I guess I have a really inquisitive brain. I like to find out about different parts of the world. You know, if we're going somewhere, I always read up on it. I find books written in it. Like last year, I'd always been a fan of Donna Leone, but I knew I was going to be in Venice. So I read the whole, re she's done like 25 books in that series. I read the whole rest of the series that I hadn't done before. So, that, um, you know, I know exactly where uh, Inspector Brunetti walks and which shop he stops to get his coffee at and everything. I knew all those things. Um, well, that's nice. That's a good way to prepare. We get a lot of people in the bookstore doing that when they say they're headed wherever they're headed, you know, trying to find a mystery set there before they go. And I think that's great because you yeah. kind of read up on it, learn a little bit, but you're still getting a great story. Yeah, I agree. Well, I'm going to ask John, I think we probably have some questions coming in. Um, I was going to double check in with him and see if we do. Oh, okay, there we go. Can you see me and hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So yeah, we do have some questions from the crowd. So I responded to Andrea and told her in it, but just in case anybody's watching on YouTube and they don't see the comments, uh, Andrea wonders where she should start with the Lady Georgie series. Well, 
if you, I, I always recommend people read the first book because then you know Georgie's background and you see her stuck in a castle in Scotland with no hope for the future apart from marrying an awful man that the family's gonna choose for her. So she chooses to flee down to London and make her own way in a very difficult world. And so you see Georgie at her very most vulnerable. And um, through the series, she's gradually become more confident and found her way a little bit in life. Um, but after that, all of the books are complete in themselves. You really could pick up anyone and enjoy the book and, and then go back and find out more about those characters. So I do try and write each mystery so it is complete in itself. I don't leave you hanging at the end of it or anything. Right. Uh, Jean asks, uh, she says, when she's reading your books, uh, she's engrossed and nothing else gets done. Is it similar for you when you're writing? Do you just get so engrossed that other things get ignored? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And the, I, I try and get the first draft done as quickly as possible because um, I can't really shut it off while, while that first, while, when that story is forming, I will wake up in the middle of the night and I will turn over and I'll go, oh wait, she wouldn't have said that. And then I have to rush and scribble down what she would have said. So to get those characters out of my mind, I find I do a lot of my good work driving around in a car normally. I'll get in the car and I'll talk to myself and I'll go through a scene and, well, what made you come here? Well, I, I, I wasn't going to, but then I found out, you know, so I'm sitting, thank God now that people have got Bluetooth in their cars, because before that they thought I was a crazy lady because I was shouting at someone in a car. Now they just think I'm on the phone, you know, when I go, how dare you come here? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so Andreas um, says there's lots of comments about uh, Rebecca and Daphne du Maurier love in the comments. So she said, so before this, would you say that um, du Maurier's writing was a big influence on you before you decided to use Rebecca for this one? I would, I won't say, I mean, I've never been as gothic as Daphne du Maurier, but I have always, I've loved her books. And I love the fact that they're that, they're slightly spooky. Um, and then they play with your emotion. And I think a writer that can play with your emotion is doing a wonderful job. I think my favorite of her books is called The House on the Strand. And it's about a mind altering drug and it takes place in two time periods. That might've been one of the reasons I wanted to try the two time periods too, because you do, you go back from the 14th century to the present and you have these two different stories going on and, and it's brilliant. And then you've got this really interesting twist at the end. I mean. Twist at the end, I really love too. Now she's she's always been a writer. And of course, Frenchman's Creek, if you go down through the Bluebell Woods to the water at my sister-in-law's house, you look out across the Helford River and on the other side is Frenchman's Creek. So I'm very closely connected to them. That's exciting. That's uh, she's one. Of, she's one of my favorites, and Frenchman's Creek yeah. is one of my favorites too. Yeah. So we've seen uh, kind of speaking of Daphne du Maurier in the last couple of years. We've seen this kind of re huge resurgence in like people writing homages to Gothic fiction, trying to put their own spin on it. Why do you think that we're seeing kind of a revitalization of that now? I think there's a huge revitalization of all fiction, not just Gothic. I mean, look mm -hmm. at the, all the spins that have done on. I mean, the complete uh, pastiche of Sherlock Holmes, of Jane Austen, all these things. And I think it's because we're in a time where we don't feel safe. We want to be, when you write about, when you've got historical, when you've got, say, Sherlock Holmes, we know what happens to Sherlock Holmes. So anything you do about him, you know it's got to have a good outcome at the end because, mm -hmm. you know, he went off to raise bees. So um, uh, I think we want to read about a time where we know we'll be safe in the book. And even if it's Gothic, it's long and it's safely long ago that, that it's not gonna worry me tomorrow. The other thing is that when you've got mysteries, modern crime has become so robotic. We've got CSI and we've got DNA and blood spatters. So you find a crime, you send it to the crime lab and they say, okay, this was a person, you know, we're looking for someone who's five foot seven with a limp and they can go out and find him. Um, Whereas in the past, it relied entirely on your wits and um, entirely on observation and intuition and um, following someone through darkened streets. So crime was much more appealing to me in the old days. Yeah. Um, so Sherry says she loves how you've um, been loosely basing Georgie's adventures on classics or true stories like Rebecca and White Mischief. She wonders, was four funerals and maybe a wedding partly based on great expectations? Oh God, no, that, I never thought of, I'm gonna to have to go and read that again, Sherry. I'm gonna, um, 
no, it wasn't. It was just I. I just wanted to have. Um, I wanted to have Georgie inherit. See, I always like. They say if you love your characters, you make them suffer. So I think what would be wonderful for Georgie? What about if she inherits what looks like this wonderful house, and then she gets there, and oh, it's not quite as wonderful as I thought. It's in fact, it's a little bit scary, you know. So that's what I do with her all the time. I take her somewhere where everything seems to be going smoothly and then I pull the rug out from under her. So, you know, poor Georgie's never gonna have an easy life while I've got her. Uh, Larissa says that she's read all of the Evans books and really misses him. Any chance we might see him again? Oh God, I probably get an email saying that every day. Um, and I miss him too. I'd really like to go back, see if he's been promoted, if he and Bronwyn have any children yet, you know. Mm -hmm. The big problem is time. I'm currently writing one of the Georgie books and quite a big stand, a 400 page standalone every year. And they both require research and they both require going somewhere to do the research. I, I hope some, I mean, I won't say never. I hope that I can at least do a novella, maybe an e-novella in which we go back and visit him. Uh, I can't say when that will be, but that series is still under option by CBS. CBS has had it had it for option for two years and then they let it slide and then a few months ago they came back and said we really need to re renew that option so whether it will end up as a tv series that would be interesting except it's cbs you know i don't want it made in malibu with cardboard houses you know i'd, I'd like them to go and shoot it in wales yeah <laughs> and you know nothing nothing helps get a series you know back running again like a tv series being made from it so that's always a good yeah. Uh, yeah. So Donna asks, um, have you ever thought of writing a book or a short story from Darcy's perspective? That is a good question. Yeah. I mean, no, I, I think someone's asked me that before. Um, I haven't, but it will be interesting if I'm asked to do a short story in a collection sometimes, maybe that's what I'll try to do because that would, um, he's an interesting character because when I first created him, I wanted Georgie to have uh, a young man she's fallen for, and we don't quite know if he's good or bad. We don't quite know whether she's making a bad decision or not. So I wanted him to have that bad boy image. Um, and now I think, you know, we pretty much know he's a good guy, but and we pretty much know he's reliable, but it will be interesting to see how his mind works in a story, yeah. Um, and uh, Rebecca says she's curious about the revision process. Do you have any advice um, for aspiring authors going through revisions and edits? Um, well, this is my process. I, I go all the way through the book and every day I start with what I wrote the day before and I polish that. So you never have to look at a blank screen. And I go all the way through the book to the end. And then I go all the way through. Um, and what I do often is read it out loud. Um, you can hear any clumsy sentences or anything when you're actually reading it out loud. So I read quite a lot out loud to myself and then I do a complete revision. And, um, and then I give it to various people whose opinion I really value and they do different things. One is very good on pace and will say, oh, did we need to know that there? What would happen if we didn't find out until there? And, and one is just a really good uh, involved reader and she will say oh don't make her say that that sounds rather mean so I listen to that and then the third one is my husband who is Mr. Picky and he will go through and say you use that word three times in that paragraph um, so and also he he's very big on especially in the Evan book no man would ever say that and then I say to him well Evan is a sensitive man so he's not like you so um, uh, so uh, you know, I, so I get my three people and then I, I go through and do input from all three of those and then it goes off. And I think you can over judge yourself too. You can work something too many times. You have to judge your instinct, but the reading out loud is probably the best tool because you can hear, oh goodness, that she sounds terrible in this scene or, oh, oh goodness. I, you know, if you get tired of reading it, if you read a sentence and it's gone on too long and your mind's got, then other people are going to get tired. So it's, you're, it's great at judging yourself doing that. Um, so Alana asks, um, have you been tempted to go back and do sequels to any of the standalones? Yes. Um, when I wrote in Farley Field, I left the ending slightly open in, we've got Margot going up to train for the Secret Service. 
we've got um, uh, we've got the younger uh, daughter Phoebe who uh, is going off to boarding school. We've got Dido who's dying to do something. So I've left all these little openings. So I think it'd be kind of a fun one to go back to. Um, my when I said to my editor I might like to do a a, a, a sequel, she said not yet. Um, she wanted me to write more things, and of course I do have I have lots of really good ideas, and it's. The, the the freedom I have to tell you is lovely to write a series because it's like visiting old friends each time every time you come back it's like a high school reunion there's Belinda and there's granddad and there's mummy and there you know where you are writing a standalone it's literally starting from square one each time but the lovely thing about that is that I can say to this editor I'd really like to do a book set in uh, um, set in the south of France with Queen Victoria and they go oh wonderful and then I'd say, I'd really like to do a book set in Venice in three different time periods. Oh, brilliant. So, you know, the chance that to do anything that just tickles your fancy is really a lovely one. So when you start plotting out a standalone and you have kind of ideas for several of them, how do you decide which idea is the one that's going to be the one that you're going to start working on? Well, in Farley Field, it was completely driven by finding a traitor. Um, so that story was complete by the end of that book. We had we had solved that mystery. We, uh, but we've left some of those characters in places. We had so different, so many different plot lines in that. We were following about five different people. So we have a chance to go after any of them. And there's so many more stories to write about World War II. Um, I thought it'd be fun to take Margot up to the training center in Scotland and then see what might happen to her up there. But um, we'll see, I, I mean, yeah. I've got lots of ideas I'm dying to tackle, so probably I won't get to them all in my lifetime. And that's that's a good place to be. Yeah. Uh, Sherry says, in Malice at the Palace, Georgie and Queenie see a ghost. Have you ever been tempted to do anything supernatural? Um, yeah, I mean, those ghosts are real at Kensington Palace. I mean, the, lots of people have seen them and they, they know about them. And um, so I did use, I use real ghosts in the, in the story. Um, and um, Georgie comes from a castle in Scotland that's report, reputed to be haunted. So, you know, that could happen sometime. I'm a little bit, um, uh, I'm a little bit wary about ghosts because I think I believe in them a bit too much. And um, when I was at Kensington Palace doing the research for Malice at the Palace, I said to one of the guards there, you know, they keep, they have these guards to make sure you don't walk off with me. I said, um, have you ever seen one of the ghosts here? And he said, no, he said, I felt cold here. He said, but I, um, I was put in, um, I was put, billeted in a grace and favor cottage at one of the other palaces once. And um, my, gra my father was visiting and staying with us and we'd gone up to bed and I realized I hadn't turned off the TV set. So I went down the stairs and standing at the bottom of the stairs was this woman all in black. And she looked up at me and she said, once I was blind, now I can see. And he said, I came up those stairs so fast, you wouldn't believe it. And then I, I said, Dad, go down and turn off the TV. <laughs> but um, so I think you'll find in England, lots of people. My, my sister-in-law, where I spend every summer, has a haunted room. It's a room that's out over, they have this big porch and there's a room that's out over the porch. And in the past, when her sons were younger and they brought a girlfriend to stay and she slept in that room, there was more, more than one occasion where she came running out of that room and said someone was standing over my bed. Um, uh, so, uh, and it's funny because my, one of my daughters who um, stayed in that room quite often, my daughter, she went to school, who went to college in Salzburg and then she worked in Germany for three years and she used to spend all of her holidays at Merthen and she always slept in that room. She never saw anything. So. The, the rumor is that the ghost is quite at home with a family member, but um, doesn't like strangers. So lots of good things to write with ghosts, but mm -hmm. if you get too much into the woo-woo, can you, I mean, Malice at the Palace was stretching it slightly and that maybe the ghost helped to conclude a mystery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's tricky once you start doing that. Yeah, like how much does the ghost know and how do people find out that, that makes it tricky when you're doing mysteries. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so 
So if you guys um, joined us late, we've been talking with Reese Bowen about her most recent Lady Georgie mystery, The Last Mrs. Summers. Uh, if you missed the first part of the chat, you'll be able to watch it once we finish up. Uh, Facebook will upload the whole thing. We'll also be uploading it to our YouTube channel uh, in the next couple of days so you can watch it there as well. Uh, Reese was kind enough to send us a nice big stack of signed book plates. So we've got signed book plates to go with our copies of it or if you order, if you're new to the series, if you wanna try her Royal Spinus, we can tuck in a book plate um, there. Uh, our coworker. Cindy has been chatting with Reese. Cindy, do you want to tell us a little bit about conversations with the page real quick before we, we tune out for today? Absolutely. So I run a literary salon in non-pandemic times. It's um, um, in someone's home and we invite whoever is interested in coming, bring authors to town. And right now we're using a similar format to this. We're on Zoom. So it's cfapage.net if you're interested. And I've also launched a podcast called Thoughts from a Page Podcast. So if you like podcast, you can check that one out. So thanks, John. Sure, and I just dropped a link in the comments to the conversations from a page um, thing. I've also been doing links for like Louise Penny's books, um, uh, Reese's Standalone. So she's been talking about books. There are plenty of comments uh, in there. Uh, one of the things that's so hard, the store is closed right now. Um, we're still doing curbside pickup and phone orders, but uh, Reese, one of your events are always ones that we look forward to as a staff all, yeah. all year. You know, we're, we're all huge fans of not only the books, but getting to see you because I mean, at this point, you're, you know, murdered by the book family. So we're, we're so thankful that you were able to take some time and chat with us this afternoon. Oh, I'm so glad that I could do it. I was thinking, you know, this, this very moment in any other year, I would be coming into your store and there'd be all these lovely smiling faces and, and it will be Phil and there'll be people standing at the back. And I think, wow, this is a great crowd. And you'd all be looking up and smiling at me and, and I'd see faces that I recognize. And I think this is so nice. You know, it's, it is, it's like coming home. When you come to bookstores where you've always had a welcome, you just come in and you think this is really good. And I really miss doing this talk that I'm looking at Cindy and I'm looking at John, but I can't see all the rest of you. You know, I can't see all these lovely people. I like to go, oh, I recognize there's Shirley, there's so-and-so, there's, you know, there's Kathy and, and I can't see you. So um, that, that's the sad thing about these Zoom talks is you can't interact with the people. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. They are definitely, you've got a, a nice, happy crowd watching us. Um, so before we tune out, just as I mentioned, we're uh, still closed for browsing, but you can visit us at murderbooks.com. Um, the best way to support the store is if you're enjoying the events is to order the author's books. If it's not the, the new one, one of the earlier ones, we realize kind of with the world and the situation that it is right now, that's not always an, uh, an option for everyone. So we have created a virtual tip jar, which I've dropped the link there if you uh, still want to contribute something but aren't able to pick up a new book. Um, again, Reese, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Hopefully, fingers crossed, we everybody can do what we're supposed to and we'll get to actually see you in the store again next year. Absolutely, Let, let's hope, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Cindy. I love you all. Thank you, Reese. Bye. Bye.